Hello and welcome back to another edition of Stager Insights. Today, my guest is Shell Brodnex. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Now, for those of you who don't know Shell, and I don't know how you can be in the staging industry and not know Shell, she is in the top 100 most influential people. She also is a Stevie Award finalist for Best Executive, and twice you got that award. Uh, Central Valley Women's Council of Realtors, Businesswoman of the Year, and the Staging and Design Network Home Staging Industry Leader of the Year. So she is the founder and the executive, uh, chief executive officer of the Real Estate Staging Association. Uh, and that's really what we want to talk about today. So uh, I know in maybe just talk a little bit about your very diverse background. I was listening to somebody who said you're a Swiss army knife of careers. <laughs> that was great. So I know about the private investigator license. What else have you done? I was. I was a private investigator for about a decade. Um, I loved that job. Um, tons of stories on that. But pre previous, so amazing. You go through your life and all these different chapters of your life. That was a very interesting, uh, good decade. Um, what did I do after that? Um, after that, oh, I was in, you know, management, upper management in the collections industry. It's also where I used my PI license. So that was a lot of fun. Um, Asset I worked recovery, like, I think I remember reading. Asset recovery, yeah. Um, so we did, um, in, in part of what I did in the collections industry, we did asset recovery, but I also, my, the best part of it was when I worked in the legal department. So I would direct the attorneys that I worked with, who to sue, how to sue, what stuff they had to take away to seize it. So I would write all the writs of execution and all that stuff for the legal team. Um, so I did that for a long time. That was a lot of fun. And after that, I... Um, Got out of, I got out of that industry and it got to the point when I was a PI, it's like, if there's nothing more information you couldn't find, and this was before Google, we didn't have the Google. Yeah, we so didn't have you, the Google. You didn't have the Google, so you really had to have some serious talent to be able to find assets of people. Um, so it got to the point where I, you know, there was no more challenge in it for me. So I left and um, started over, dumped it upside down, started over and then started uh, working in the real estate staging industry and started uh, worked for a company that uh, taught people to be real estate stagers. And I met you and the rest is history. And you were doing marketing and sales there, right? Yeah, I was the director of sales and marketing. And now you are the owner and operator of the Sisterhood Stables. I am. So I think it's important that we started with that to give people a background of when we say you are the founder um, of the Real Estate Staging Association, that there's a solid background behind the startup. Because for the last decade, we know you and I have known each other for a long time, and you've worked really tirelessly to advance professionalism and excellence in our industry, uh, not only by creating the trade association, but fostering, fostering you know, the, the togetherness through the, the conventions and the myriad of things that you provide through RISA. So I wanted to give an opportunity for us to talk to people who are not part of RISA or are not, they have a membership, but they don't really get involved. Uh, let's start at the beginning. We've seen lots of changes over the past 20 years. So why, do, why does an industry like staging need a trade association? Great question. Uh, if people wanna be taken seriously, that's the one thing that's common thread over the last 20 years has been we need more legitimacy, you know, agents don't take us seriously, you know, it's just something that's fluffy or, you know, anybody can do it. Well, in order to combat that, staters need to organize. And it, it takes organization of an industry in order to do that, to have that collective voice, to be able to stand together with the unity and diversity um, amongst our peers in order to drive an industry forward. So like the National Association of Realtors has been around for over a hundred years. They organized effectively and Women's Council, same thing, American Medical Association, the, uh, the Bar Association, uh, the Canadian Association of Realtors, every trade that's out there, every group that's a profession, they have an organization that's representing them in their best interest because they organize. This is the difference. You know, stagers can go out and they can meet on their own. Every once in a while we hear, eh, who wants to pay dues to Teresa? We can just meet on our own. Yeah. You can. Legit, it's, you know, 
a buck, 190 bucks a year for a general membership. It's not a lot of money. It's less than, you know, 10 bucks a month, 11 bucks a month, something like that. You can meet on your own. You can do those things on your own, but you're not organized. And then if once we find, you know, some people might break away and they say, oh, let's do something on our own. They do. But then they say, you know what? We want a little bit more. We want to have a speaker somewhere. Well, do you have insurance for that? Are you protected? Are you organized that way? Are you going to pay taxes on what you're doing? So there's a benefit to being involved with a professional organization such as ours because we meet all those criteria. So it's really the difference of operating, um, you know, are you just getting together with a bunch of friends as a hobby to meet and talk about things? Yeah. Or are you doing something as a collective group, as a professional group? So Reese is a professional trade association. So one of the things that I know you and I have had conversations about is that there are groups throughout North America mm -hmm. and they pass themselves off as associations, groups of things for, for stages to belong to. Why is it important for an average stager to belong to a nonprofit organization like RISA? Because when you belong to a nonprofit organization, and especially when you donate your time and your energy to a leadership position, you are giving your time and your efforts to uphold an industry when you do it with somebody that's in a for-profit situation or it's just not a nonprofit, you're donating your time to build somebody else's for-profit business. So do you want to be an employee of another, you know, a for-profit group and work with them and get paid a salary? More power to you. That's great. Everybody deserves to do that. But when you're looking at volunteer leadership roles, just as when you have them in NAR and um, the Canadian Association of Realtors and their, the provincial associations and the state associations, when you donate your time with them as an agent, you're doing it to grow an industry. Same thing with RISA. When you're doing it, you're growing the industry. Okay. And why would that matter to somebody who thinks that they're just got a part-time staging job and it's a gig? And I read somebody in one of the groups the other day saying, and I didn't charge for my time because it's just my time. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. 20 years in and I can't stand it. I, you know, um, it's important just because of that statement, because I understand doing something as a hobby and something that you're passionate about. I totally get it. But just because you're passionate and it's a hobby, why would you devalue yourself? Your time is still worth something. And if you want to do something as a hobby, do it as a hobby, but go work for somebody else. Let them pay you. So yes. a lot of times stagings, you know, it's very right brain, left brain. A lot of people get into it and say, oh, I just love the creative. I just want to have fun. I just want to do this. Great. But then they make all the business mistakes and the business mistakes is what devalue our industry. Eventually, you'll go out of business if you're operating that way, and um, you'll, you'll leave devastation behind for the industry. So it's important, even if you're working from a hobbyist level, that you belong to your trade association because you don't know what you don't know. And we want to get people in, and we want to raise everybody up. Rising tides raise all boats. And it's very important for everybody to have this unified message and support system. And somebody who's, you know, even if you're starting out as a hobby or you're not sure you want to go full time, that's important. It's important for you to have this. So someone would pay membership membership dues to the National Association, and then they can join a local chapter. So let's Absolutely. talk about the local chapter and what's the purpose of that. And, you know, what would a stager get from that? Because there are dues at the local level too, right? Um, sometimes there are. Some chapters elect not to have dues. It kind of oh. depends. Um, I'm, I respectfully disagree with the chapters when they decide let's not have dues. I don't believe that should be a thing. I think all chapters should choose dues, but right now they have the choice in whether or not they want to do it or not. So the local chapter, so if we equate this kind of like to real estate, so you'd have NAR and then underneath NAR, you have your state associations or your uh, local association of realtors where the locals, it's kind of like what our chapters are. Um, they are actual corporations, just like your local association of realtors. Um, they're, they're a corporation. So are our chapters. Again, this is not a hobby. This is the difference between a hobbyist group and a professional group. So all of our chapters are formed as corporations and have to abide by all the corporate codes and laws and nonprofit laws within their particular state. And in the U.S., we're a nonprofit, so we have subordinates. So all of our chapters are on our nonprofit status. So when you join a chapter, you don't have to pay taxes on the income that the chapters bring in. That is a benefit. And then we also have insurance that covers 
our chapters and our leaders as well. Um, so when people come into this, it's a, again, it's a local professional organization to benefit of belonging to national. And on that local level, the goal of the chapter should be to raise awareness about staging on the local level to impact how real estate is sold as one. And then number two is also to provide support services for members of the actual chapter. So they can uh, have speakers come in, speak about anything staging related, but they should also be having meetings that agents want to come to because they want to be the networker. Stagers are the ones that have all the connections. And so it's really important that they have meetings that are involving the real estate agents or they do events throughout the year, have one or two bigger events during the year and invite real estate agents to them so they can make that local impact. Okay. So, um, God, I went off on a tangent that I was thinking of two questions at the same time. <laughs> you know what that happens when you, <laughs> doesn't work, doesn't work. So I was going to say, what, what, changes what do you think has been the biggest change that you've seen over the let's just say even in the last 10 years because i think in the last 10 years um it's when professionalism has really taken a big leap you know I yeah really uh, yeah i would i totally agree with that time frame too um i think one of the number one things that i've seen is that people in the last decade have scaled their businesses so number one um, they've done it in a couple ways. Number one, the quality of staging. Uh, Christine, hands down in the last 22 decades, we've been in this 20 years, I've known you. And the difference of staging 20 years ago and the staging today is that the staging today could end up on the cover of a magazine. Yeah. Um, in staging 20 years ago, let's create a little PDF handout. It's the difference. You know what I mean? And, um, with that being said, they have uh, the vacant stagings, especially they're building their inventory because now they have the option to buy wholesale. 20 years ago, the wholesale furniture vendors wouldn't let people in. They wouldn't even sell to stagers. Yeah. And we beat down their doors and beat down their doors. I mean, six years, I called Las Vegas market going, please work with us. And one day Kim calls and she's like, I get it. I'm like, thank God, let's work together. So, so that's the Risa buying group. So talk about that a little bit, because I think that is sure. thing. You know, yeah, so we have a buying a group buying. within Risa. So any stager can now go and, you know, if you have a resale license or whatever it is called in your state or your province, where you can buy things wholesale, you can go and get an account. But when you go and get an account, a lot of the uh, vendors want you to spend 25, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars as a minimum order in order to place it. So that's a that's an, a barrier entrance for most people. Um, so what I've done is I've gone out and I've negotiated lower prices. So I've said, hey, instead of treating staters as onesies and twosies, treat our members as a group. This is our buying power. That's right. the other thing, the legitimacy about Risa is that. This is collective buying power, y'all. That we are way stronger the more we band together than we are if we fraction off into little bitty groups. It's about unity. And to the buying group, you can go in and some of these vendors have said, okay, no minimums, or they've lowered the minimums. Now, obviously with COVID, some of them have said, you know, we need to have, to have a little bit of a minimum. So before where the minimum was zero, it might be $800 now or $1,000. But the $50,000 and the $20,000 minimums those don't exist in our buying group. Yeah. And then in addition, there's three price levels, your designer showroom pricing, which anybody can get. Then you've got your stocking dealer. And that's usually when you have to spend the big minimums to get them. And then there's container shipping where you're ordering, you know, a hundred sofas and being shipped over on a container. So what I do is I go in and say that stocking dealer price that the one that you reserve for the, you know, the furniture um, selling companies, yeah. the big box stores, give my people that price or an additional percentage below that price. So we have a lot of them that will actually offer an additional percentage below their wholesale, below their stocking dealer price, and that's collective buying power. Um, so that was one of the changes. That's why people have been able to scale, scale their business and be more profitable and improve what their staging looks like because they have access now to better quality inventory. And then of course they've just grown and now people are having businesses with employees, giant warehouses, moving trucks, profit sharing, medical benefits. And multiple locations with- And multiple locations. Several of them, yeah. Yeah, so it's been phenomenal. What do you yeah. think has been the most important change? In the last 20 years, I, I'm actually gonna say Risa. I'm, I'm gonna say that because 
20 years ago, it was very different than it is now. It's like nobody, there, there's these different designations. Certain ones didn't want to talk to other ones. There was no unity. It wasn't that we're a staging community. We were fragmented. And through RISA, we really did create some unity. Um, so unity to be able to move forward and promote more legitimacy as an industry, I think the formation of the trade association is, is one of the, the better changes that we've made and one that's made a huge impact. And one of the things, like, I think it's clear to membership is that you don't come to RISA or RISA chapter per se for education. And so one of the things that you developed was an accreditation process for mm. the training providers. Uh, yeah. Why was that important? That was important because uh, I was waking up one day for a month every single day, getting phone call after phone call after phone call of stagers being ripped off by a training school who made it on scene and ripped off thousands of people. Yeah. Um, just, just financially devastated thousands of people. And I was talking on the phone to women crying about it. I and I went to bed one day and I woke up the next day and I said, I can't breathe another moment until I do something to try to make sure this does not happen again. And um, I, it took me a year to write the program. So I went off the uh, U.S. Department of Education and their accreditation process. I mimicked how it is that they work. What are the important things that get asked to, in order to accredit somebody? What are these standards we need to create um, in order to offer our accreditation? So it took a long time to write the program. We got it together. Um, CSP was one of the first ones to get to earn the accreditation. It was a lengthy application. I know, you, yes. I think the binders were like this, several binders. I know everybody was hating me and wanting to put a fork in my eye after that one, but it was important because the application process, what actually happened for a lot of people was saying, oh wait, we didn't think about this. That's a good idea. And here's this other part of the application. Well, we didn't think of that and that's a good idea. So people started writing more things into the programs uh, to make it just a more solid program. It makes the uh, education provider a stronger provider themselves in going through this because there's a self-discovery part of the app. Um, and then they meet our standards. And if they meet the standards, then we can issue the accreditation. So we review everything. We check the fiscal soundness. I want to make sure that if somebody's accredited through RISA, that if they fly across country to show up at a Marriott hotel for a three-day class, that that education provider is going to be there. And they're not going to walk in and have empty doors or have nobody show up, which has happened in the past. Um, so that's a little bit about the program. I, I think it's uh, also one of the, the bigger changes to the industry to make sure that there's a neutral third party accrediting uh, education providers legitimately. Yeah, no, I would agree. And the other thing that I find sometimes people don't really understand is convention. You know, because there's a perception of convention. It's like, oh, it's just like a party. And, you know, you don't really need to go. So let's talk about that um, because conventions are very important, uh, not just, I think, to the industry and the camaraderie, but for the growth of the professional. So uh, let's talk about some of your highs and lows with conventions. Yeah, for sure. So we've been doing RisaCon since 2008. Sorry, 2009 was our first Resacon. It's when I got married. Um, it was a, um, it's been definitely growing, you know, over the years. Uh, we went from, you know, 200 people to 450 people. Um, we've had amazing speakers over the year. Uh, we have a lot of the same speakers, the, the professionals and the leaders in the industry. People say, well, you know, why is this person speaking again? Well, they submitted they submitted and they had great content and they're a leader. So yeah, we want these people to come back and share their brains because if they don't, you're not going to know what they know. So these people are willing to give back to the industry by sharing their knowledge with others. And then of course we have professional speakers as well. Um, it is so important. I think if you're in a profession to keep yourself educated and keep yourself involved. So it's one thing to be in the Facebook groups. Those are great. We love them. But one-on-one -on -one and going to an event where you're actually learning things and then you get to choose and we're recording the sessions now. Um, so you can also watch them afterwards where before you could only pick so many because you're only one person, you can go only see so many while you're there. Now you can actually go home and see what you missed. Um, oh, so great. there's so much more value in it uh, for what we're bringing to the table now. And um, this year we have Gloria Mayfield Banks as our keynote speaker. Um, she rose to the top of Mary Kay 
products. And um, I've watched her for the last three years. I wanted her three years ago and um, then COVID hit. And so we were going virtual. So we were tabling everything. And uh, this year I actually found another speaker that blew my socks off. And when I went there, glorious thing popped right up in my face. And I was like, all right, that's a sign. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm going to is she available? And I got her and I was like, holy moly, I can't believe I just landed her. I can't wait to interview her. I cannot wait for everybody to see her. We will have a video of her on our website soon. She is so inspiring. She, anybody, that's the way I think anybody can make it in a, a, a cosmetic sales company. I'm not mocking Mary Kay at all, but that the structure of that, when you can do what she did and this woman set national, she blew the record off of everything. Yeah. I want to know you. I want to know what you know. And uh, I think she's going to be fantastic. I hope everybody loves her. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I worked with Mary Kay a long time ago. One of my, one of my uh, stepping stones and growth for sure. So convention then is our structured um, sessions where speakers from the industry and general speakers from a motivational perspective and financial perspective. Uh, so you will learn from that as well. And then you yes. have um, something that you call Stager Talks. What are those? Stager Talk is our vlog slash live video podcast. Um, so we have it also, it's on Spotify as a podcast. But this is where I interview um, industry professionals like you're doing right now. Um, I do the same thing. And so we will have a lot of stager talks where I'm going to talk to some of the speakers ahead of time. So if you're on the fence about coming to Resacon, you actually just need to jump off and go sign up and go. This is a no brainer for anybody in the, in the industry, no matter where you're at in your career, in your business, there is something there for you. Um, so it's important to, to get off that fence and, and to kind of jump in. But at all the sessions, you have three sessions to choose from. Um, like I said, there are pros, there's legal, there's HR, there's QuickBooks, there's photography, sales, you name it, we're talking about it. This year is a really, really good program. So I feel that if you are a new stager, um, whether you're trained or not, whether you're doing it part-time or full-time, I think that you owe it to yourself, you owe it to your clients, and you owe it to the industry to go in your first year. And I know that's a big commitment when you have to fly somewhere, stay in a hotel and move into a room where you don't know 450 people. Um, but I think if you did that in your very first year, if it was a requirement, let's say, it, what it does is really open up your eyes to the industry, to its professionalism, to its growth, to its potential for you as an individual in your company. But uh, you just get that you know, eagle view of everything, you know, the, the bird's eye view perspective. perspective. Um, instead of waiting until your business generates some income, put the money out and go and get that perspective. You know, I think that is a key thing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's kind of like, I know you've heard this too, and when you coach stagers like I do, where they say, oh, I'll get a website in about a year. Let me make some money first. And, or this is my crappy website now. And they don't put anything into it and it looks horrible. And they're like, oh, let me do it in a year when I make some money, when I can afford it. And I'm like, yeah, no, no sis, that's not the way you do it. Then you got to convince all, all the people that you touched during 12 months to take a look at you again. And when you put it out there like that, you just advertise to the world that you're green. Nobody wants to do that. Don't do it. It doesn't, doesn't serve you well. And when you don't go to Resacon, especially I've had so many people tell me that waited till year three, four, five to go to Resacon. And afterwards they're like, I don't know why I didn't do this in the beginning. I don't know why I didn't do the buying group sooner. I don't know why I didn't Resacon sooner. Why didn't I get trained sooner? Yeah. I don't know. Cause we all been saying, let's do it sooner. Let's do so it. Let's do it. So I totally agree with that. I mean, you're going to walk away the investment that you make in going to Resacon if you knew that that investment is going to give you the knowledge, the confidence that you need, the connections that you need in order to make your first year better or your second year better, that's a no brainer. There's yeah. no reason not to do it. I know, I, you know, well, you know, I teach uh, people how to do the business side. That's we're teaching the staging business side. Uh, we do refine the skill sets to make them be able to do outstanding work in the field. Uh, but I was talking to a stager a couple of weeks ago, 
uh, not a CSP, but who said to me, would you please take a look at my work and give me some feedback? And, you know, when you ask me for feedback, I'm going to give you feedback. That's mm -hmm. honest. And I asked why certain things had been selected for the room because I, I think they were inappropriate. You know, it was like a make do sort of situation. So tell me more about that. Was there some crisis going on over the budget? Were there some restrictions with the, with the seller? And it was like, I couldn't afford to buy any more inventory and it was all I have. And I'm like, no, you can't stage that way. You can't. I mean, you can't. This is Somebody paid serious, you money for that. Yes, it's a serious responsibility to be a stager. Yes, it's fun. Absolutely. It's a great job. Absolutely. But it's a serious responsibility and we need to take it more seriously than it has been. Um, why do you think that there is a challenge with real estate agents processing um, the need for this service? Oh, gosh, Christine, that's a resistance loaded question. Factor, what I call it, you know, it's like, why is there a resistance factor? You know, real estate agents who want to do their own staging, um, looking at the National Association of Realtors um, surveys that come out, they said the average real estate agent has 12 years experience, is 55 years old and female. So I look at that and I think, okay, well, when you started 12 years ago, there wasn't really a sophisticated group of stagers. So you wanted to help your client. But if you've also been in business for 12 years, you're busy. <laughs> so yeah. why would you want to take on this mantle of doing this work? It's beyond my comprehension. Yeah. They so this is the way me. I feel about it. I probably know four, maybe five people that are real estate agents and stagers and do it effectively. Now, the business model is different than I think what you initially described. Because initially what we hear is, agent, oh, I'm just going to stage it myself. And then you look at the photos and it's not staging. It's um, literally, I've gone into properties I know you've seen it too, where you walk into the laundry room and somebody's just got towels sitting there or they've got a vase on the fireplace and an area rug and nothing else. And they think, well, I should stage it myself. Yeah. I'm like, no, you just did this a disservice. People, you're earning. No, no, it's not the way it is. I know. Not the way you do it. This is what I also think too. There, it's a numbers game with stagers. So one of the hangups that I see a lot of stagers do is they keep banging their head against that wall with the same real estate agent. I can't convince them to, to do my service. How do I do it? I'm like, why? Why are you trying to? I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be shell for a second. I'm going to say, flick them like a booger and move on. I mean, it's a numbers game. And they're real estate agents. They are literally recyclable. There's millions of them, of them. millions of them. <laughs> and, millions. you know, in your local area, depending where you are, Find the ones that want to be successful. If you really want to get in with it, find somebody who is green as a real estate agent and show them what staging can do for them. Sometimes you got to teach a real estate agent how to use you. Yep. So teach them to understand, say, look, agent, you are new to the industry. And if you really want to capitalize on it, you should consider a business model where you don't take a listing unless it's had a staging consultation. Absolutely. It's very easy when you provide that to your client. It's a couple hundred bucks out of your pocket. It comes with your listing presentation. It's going to improve what it is that you're doing. So you're going to make more money. Your client's going to make more money. And at that point, once we do the consultation, if they need a full staging, then the homeowner can work that out with the particular stage or whether it be vacant or occupied, whatever the situation might be. Either way, in a hot market, it's going to get multiple offers and sell for over list price. In a slow market, your listing is going to sell while the others sit and do nothing. What type of agent do you want to be? Do you want to struggle until for many, many years of getting one listing a year? Or do you want to come out of the gate and make a big impact? Because I know one thing, Christine, I have a real estate agent who's a friend of my father's who was my listing agent when I bought this property. And he came here and said, you know, oh, we should be a real estate agent. I'm like, oh, Greg, I don't want to put you all out of business. <laughs> I would blow y'all out of the water. I would, because I wouldn't take a listing unless it was staged. Yeah. I'd find a great stager. First of all, I wouldn't be a real estate agent unless I found a great stager that was in it to win it and not going to go anywhere for a long time because I would have every listing staged. It is a no brainer. It is merchandising a client's number one asset. And that's the equity in their home. Yeah. It, I, so why they don't get it, a lot of them, 
is beyond me. A lot of them, I think a lot of times people are just a little lazy. They think, oh, it's selling. Why sell it? Why sell it? Because we just did statistics, Arisa, in 2021, when it is yeah. a complete seller's market. And on average, they were selling over $40,000 over list price. Yeah. So you enlist five or $6,000 into a stage and you net 40 grand, $41,000, and it's five or six grand, you've made a $35,000 profit. Yeah. This is a no brainer. Yeah, I know. Only and proven so method to get you more money on a house. I know. And last week, I, you know, it's a hot market. It's a hot market everywhere, all across the United States and Canada. And last week in Toronto and last uh, the week before in California, totally different properties, totally different marketplaces, both sold for over a million over asking. Mm -hmm. Okay, The buyer decides and the buyer is influenced by what they see. Yes. You know? Yeah, it's incredible that, you know, that real estate agents don't don't see that need. So yeah. in winding this session up, um, Shell, give some, because I know one of the things is important to you is the law of attraction. So yeah. give some insight uh, to new and struggling or on the fence thinking about joining the industry people uh, about staging and uh, the law of attraction. Absolutely. So here's the thing, what I've what I know, I, I know this, like I'm, you know, every day ends in the letter Y. It's, it's a matter of how you focus things. So a lot of times people get in, in an industry in any job and say, oh, I'm going to go in, I'm, I'm in it to win it. I just want to, I just want to make money. Well, if you're focused and if you're new in the industry and you're worried about the money, you're worried that you didn't book a job, you're worried, 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 nothing's coming in. That's what you're going to get. You got to change your focus. So here's a quick analogy kind of relate a lot of stuff back to horses years ago you know my journey i got a big mouth and i went out on stage at a convention and told 350 people i started to ride horses and i'm going to go win a buckle and i was terrified of horses when i started so i went out after 60 days of riding decided i was going to compete with other people i don't know why i thought i would do this clearly arrogance so i went out and i did it i i competed in 12 events and I did not place. Not only did I not even place, I was last place 12 times. I was focused on winning the buckle. That's all I could see. And I was somebody who taught the law of attraction to people and I got caught up in my own mistake. So I was focused, I'm gonna win, I'm gonna win, I'm gonna win. And I wasn't focused and I was obsessed with my competitors because the people that were competing with me in my class were actually people that have been riding for like 20 years. They shouldn't have been in. I was a legitimate complaint. but. I was still focused on them and what they were doing. So I was focused on my competitors, my competition, and I was focused just on winning. Both of those things, my focus was not in the right place. My focus needed to be on mastery, yeah. mastering yeah. what my goal was with myself and my horse. I actually had to have an equine performance coach give me a written test that I, great, great, great views of how you view competition, except for this one area, Shell. And I'm like, oh, don't fail tests. I'll do it again. No, no, no. This is going to help you. You're obsessed with your competitor. Your focus is not in the right place. And I'm like, I do this for a living. I literally say this four or five times a day to people and I missed it. So I changed my focus and my goals with my horse. I'm going to get my horse and I today are going to do this, this, and this. The next time we're going to do this, this, and this. My first event out, I got first place. I didn't finish less than fourth and I won a state championship. So if you are a new stager and you're in here and you're worried about anything or your focus is on your competition or something else or just the money, you're not going to win. You need to focus on mastery, mastering every single step in your, in, in, in your particular business. Mastery on your website needs to be top notch. Mastery in your pitch needs to be top notch. Mastery in your design needs to be top notch. Mastery in how you onboard a client through cradle to grave. You pitch them on the phone. When you meet them, your email communications, everything needs to have a process. It needs to be pristine. And when you focus on mastering every single aspect of your business, that is when you will fly and you will not until then. And if you do not master every single thing, when you start seeing things happen, that's not a bad thing that something happened, fix it. Now you make sure it doesn't happen again. You have a problem with a client that does something and you're like, oh no, how did that happen? Well, was that not in your contract? Let's get it in your contract. Call your attorney and get it in your contract. Let's work on that. So anytime something negative happens, that's okay that it happens, but deal with it, handle it, massage it, tweak it, fix it. It won't happen again. Yeah. 
you know, and that lady that I was telling you about who uh, said she didn't charge for her time because it was just her doing it. Uh, that was her same thing. Her answer back to me was, but if I charge for my time, I won't be competitive with my pricing based on what's going on in the marketplace. It's like oh, you don't base your pricing on on what other people are doing because that's a spiral down to the bottom. Uh, Here's the thing with that lady. She, that, I don't know who she is, but um, if you're listening to this, call me, sis. I will help you. Here's the thing. <laughs> pricing and, and the way the mistakes sometimes that stagers make. A, if you are the low price leader and you are thirsty, that is literally what you are presenting to somebody and they are judging you. Potential clients are judging you and they're going to compare you to other people in your industry, for sure your competitors. So when you come in for a bid, I know people that can go in and can bid a job at $15,000. The next person will come in and they will bid it at uh, uh, $10,000 and someone else will bid it at $5,000. And the person that bid it at 10 will get it. And they get it because they walk in with confidence and they walk in with their pristine systems and what it is that they're doing. And they're not thirsty. So when they deliver the news of what it is, they do it with confidence. So then you go back and somebody comes to them and says, oh, can you lower your price? I really want to work with you. I like your work, but someone else would do it for eight. And at that point, it's the professional's job to say, we have a fair bid. We don't inflate our prices and to negotiate them down later. However, what I can do is I can throw in another bathroom if that would make it, you know, feel better for you or however you want to word it. Or what's your budget? I can't do this job for that, but what is your budget? And then you can subtract from what it is that you're doing. But if you walk in with the confidence and you stick by your guns and you don't lower your price, nine times out of 10, the client is going to choose you. They're going to choose that person. Deal breaker. That's right. And it's just when you're the low price leader, you are compared. I just did work on my stables. And, you know, one guy came in at 12 grand and I didn't like his vibe. Another guy came in at 20 grand, loved his vibe, thought it was too high. Another guy came in at 15, 16, liked his vibe, thought he was fair. That's who I ended up going with. Um, and we're very, very happy with it. So there, people are always comparing. So you just need to figure out and understand what you're projecting Um is what people are going to compare you about. And so you want to make sure that what you're projecting is correct, optimum, not thirsty, and fair. If you're going to be in business, be in business. Be in business. Be in business. Don't have one, can't have one hoof in and one hoof out, you know? Be in, business. Gotta be in business. Do it. Shell, thanks so much for your time this morning. I really appreciate it. Um, and I wish you all the very best with the convention this year. Uh, I, before we go, let's talk about awards. <laughs> let's oh, talk, yes, let's awards. Let's talk about awards. Um, because those are really an important thing too. So give them some information about how they submit for awards. Absolutely. Okay. So home staging industry awards. We've been doing these things since I think 2008. Um, this is one of the best ways to market yourself. Okay. So especially if you are new and what I can tell you is there have been many, many years where people say, oh, I'm afraid, or I don't feel confident enough to do it. And then they don't enter. And then there's not a whole lot of people in the category. So you could have got a top 10 had just shown up. That's the big problem too with a lot of people. People don't show up, show up, participate, let's play. Enter into these awards, enter into several categories, get yourself a top 10, get yourself a winning in that category. This year, we're not gonna have an overall professional stager of the year this year, but we're gonna have all the ones that are still professional stagers of the years in their individual categories. So right. it is imperative for people to get out there and do this. And then you get that award and you get that logo and then you do a press release. Every person it is that I know that has gotten one of these awards on the top ends, their businesses have grown. I know people um, that have gotten the award and then all of a sudden within months, they, they need a warehouse and their business grows. There's something about the awards, what it does to you. A, it builds your confidence. B, it helps you market yourself because yeah. the award yeah. speaks for you. And then people see that and they're, they're impressed by it and your credentials and your leadership roles. So enter the awards. Then we have the awards banquet at RisaCon. You do not have to be present to win. We don't do anything like that. So uh, you can elect to have your awards shipped to you if that's what you want to do, if you don't want to go. But the hope would be enter the awards, get yourself a top 10, win something, go to RisaCon, grow your business. Yeah. Amen. All right. You have a wonderful day. Thanks very well, much for your you. insight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye.